I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. David Wood, a well-known futurist, author, singulitarian, and chair of the London Futurists. Dr. Wood has an MA in mathematics, graduate studies in the philosophy of science from the University of Cambridge, an honorary doctorate from the University of Westminster, and over 30 years of experience in the technology industry, ranging from mobile and OS software and OS development to corporate advisory and leadership. As a futurist, Dr. Wood has served as the co-founder of Transhumanism UK, executive director of TransPolitica, node co-chair of the Millennium Project, fellow at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, and in his current role as principal at Delta Wisdom. He also holds board positions at SingularityNet, Sustensis, the Lev Foundation, and is a former board member of Humanity Plus. David is the author of 11 books and one of T3's 100 Most Influential People in Technology. His focus is on the radical transformation of society and humanity enabled by technological disruption. So, David, welcome back. It is once again a true honor to have you with me today, sir. It's a real pleasure to be with you. Your shows are always first class. Oh, well, thank you. Now, as a futurist, uh, you are following computing and AI, life extension, and many other things. Today, we are talking about your new book, though, The Death of Death, which you co-authored with Jose Cordero. So let me start by asking for a high-level overview of what the book is about and what inspired both of you to partner up and write about life extension, longevity, and physical immortality, if we could call it that. The Jose and I are complementary. We actually first met at a conference in Helsinki in 2006. It was the Transvision Conference, which is a series of conferences. It's been held most years since 1998 on transcending human limitations, using science and technology wisely to build better humans, better relationships, better minds, better societies through better technology. Jose is a, sometimes I joke, he's a bit of an excitable Latin and I'm the doer Scottish Presbyterian. He's inclined to emphasize big positive visions and then fill in the details, whereas I tend to work the other way around, filling in lots of details and reaching my conclusion stage by stage. And we reckoned we would be better working together. We had a common interest in telling people the situation has changed as regards radical life extension. The answers that people have given to fundamental questions over the centuries are no longer the best answers because of what science has understood and because of what engineering, medicine, biotechnology is about to put in our grasp. We need to tell people it's time to change your minds about fundamental questions. Answers that have served you well psychologically, socially, since the beginning of history, are no longer the appropriate answers. Ah, well, so in your view, is death inevitable? This was on the book jacket. And when I read this, I said, I, that's, that's where I got to begin. That's the big one. Now, in the past, it was. Has this inevitability changed yet? And if not, when would you see advances in research crossing the tipping point, as it were? So that's the subject of the first chapter of the book, to show that there's nothing in biology that requires aging and death. There are some biological species that are effectively biologically immortal. Now, they do die. They die when they run out of food. They die when they get eaten. They die when they get an infectious disease. But many of these species don't become less capable. They don't become tired, weary as age goes on. They keep dividing on and on. Some simple organisms, but also some more complex organisms. Organisms that display what biologists call negligible senescence. Senescence is this technical term that explains that certainly for humans, the older we get beyond, say, the age of 35, every eight years that we live, we become twice as likely to die. So by the time you've lived 25 years, you become 10 times as likely to die. When we're quite young, we have to be pretty unlucky to die, but the older we get, the higher the odds every year. And many species are like that. They've got this growing senescence. 
but not all. Many species have negligible senescence, and we can learn from each of these. Things like the famous naked mole rat. Some of these creatures have now lived 40 years, and they are apparently immune to most treatments that would normally give species like that cancer. They are immune to other degradations and insults that would give them osteoporosis. Uh, they would give them trouble with their joints and their limbs. And the older they get, they keep on being as strong and as vital as ever. So we can learn from these creatures, learn from whales and elephants and sharks in various ways. We can learn from simpler organisms too. There's nothing in physics, there's nothing in biology that means creatures have to get weaker as they age. We can learn from that. Well, and this is such a big topic and timely in so many ways, and we will get into that more in a bit. But um, I, I did want to touch on what you've described as the moral defense. In fact, this is the subtitle of the book. The, the title is The Death of Death, The Scientific Possibility of Physical Immortality and Its Moral Defense. So I wanted to ask what the moral defense part of that meant, because typically that's response to criticize them criticism. I'm wondering who would criticize the concept of biological immortality? So there are two questions we get all the time. Is it possible to live indefinitely and healthily? And would it be good to live indefinitely and healthily? And the two negatives sort of reinforce each other. If you think it's not possible to live longer than efforts to extend life is a waste of resources, is a scandal. We should be concentrating instead in these people's minds on things that are easier to fix. I'm sympathetic to addressing low-hanging fruits, but I want to point out that actually science says we can address that question scientifically. That's when the other half of the equation kicks in. It's when people for various historical, psychological reasons or philosophical reasons they latch on to excuses as to why it would be bad if aging were abolished and people could live indefinitely long. They say, look at dictators. Uh, a dictator is in power. We can't get rid of them. Thank goodness they get old and die. And I want to say, is that really the best way to get rid of dictators, to wait until they've lived another 60 years or so? If there was a world with no aging, but there were dictators, would we really think the best thing to do would be to introduce aging and have people all around the world suffer increasing insults from aging so that this dictator was moved out? So that's one example. Other examples are people are worried reasonably. I have more sympathy with this one. They are worried that the world might run out of room. People have been worried about overpopulation since about the year 200 AD when some of the first philosophers or theologians said, there's too many people, the world can't cope. It turns out that if you have better science, better agriculture, better social structures, you can have a lot more people in the world. And we are not at the limits today by any means. And eventually, there's no hurry in this, eventually we can move into space where there's plenty of room for vastly more people. So there's a number of objections, and I've only touched on them lightly. They're quite serious and profound objections in their own way. But in our book, Jose and I, we address them and say, whatever problems there might come about if people live longer, they are smaller than the terrible problem that so many people are growing old, weak, incapable, uh, and dying. That is the biggest moral pain about our life today. Aging kills more people than any other cause of death. That's when you aggregate all the diseases that get systematically worse the older we get. So we might write on the death certificate, died of a heart problem, died of dementia. But these problems get worse in humans and in many other animals as we age. So we can also say it was aging that killed them. And in that case, if we're serious about extending healthy lifespans as a good, the most moral thing we can do is to address aging. And that's assuming people understand that things can be done, which brings me back to the first part of the answer. Yes, there's plenty we can do. Plenty scientists can do if we give them more support to hurry up the discovery and application of low-cost, high-quality rejuvenation therapies. Ah. Well, and the psychology was actually the reason I asked about moral defense, because I think that the psychology is 
built into humanity. It has been with us, right? Because aging and death has been what we consider a natural part of our world uh, since the beginning. And so it is it is so ingrained that we overlook the fact that, I mean, for every person that dies as they age, there are tremendous medical costs, right? And difficulties, pain and suffering, all of those things that could potentially be avoided, you know, along with the fact that we lose such a tremendous wealth of experience and training. I mean, if you want to put that in dollar terms, that could be hundreds of thousands of dollars to millions of dollars per person that just naturally leaves us, right? And so it is tremendous loss, no matter how you frame it. I mean, either from a personal level or a family level with the trauma and the emotional damage that happens when a family member is lost, right? For any reason, when people die, others are in pain. And we consider this natural. But if that can be avoided, that could be transformative to society. So I, I absolutely agree with you on that. There's a funny thing that for most of history, it has been irrational to be irrational about aging and death. It has been rational for us to tell ourselves, hey, it's good that we die. Let's accept it. Let's get on with life. Not think too much about this aging thing, because if we do think about it, we get terrified. And that was the experience of a large proportion of children as they grew up. They suddenly had a shocking realization. Their parents and grandparents and they themselves were likely to age and die. And for a while, that's a horrifying thought. And then we learn distraction techniques. We learn to think, oh, maybe there's a life after death. Uh, maybe it's not so bad afterwards. Maybe there's another kind of immortality in which at least some of our memories are passed down to our children. So we justify it. And culture's been very good in coming up with clever justifications. There was the saying uh, in the poem by Ovid, Dulci et decorum est pro patria mori. I'm not sure of my Latin pronunciation, but the gist is it's sweet and honorable to die for your country. That's what people said when their sons and daughters came home, or usually their sons came home from war, or their bodies died in the war. They said, well, it's good, it's sweet, it's natural. And that was a justification to allow people to keep on keeping on. So it has been rational to be irrational. But now is the time when people can get their hopes up. In the past, people were afraid to get their hopes up again because they thought they're only going to be dashed. But now I want to tell people it is time to change our minds about this, to break out from accepting aging and to say things can be better. Here's another analogy. Most of history, people accommodated slavery. They said, how else can you have a society? You need different groups of people doing different roles. So most of the holy books in history, they did not say, please free the slaves. There's none of the Ten Commandments that says, thou shalt not keep slaves. On the contrary, there's actually a commandment that says, don't envy your neighbor's slave. Just beside the bit that says, don't envy your neighbor's wife, and before the bit that says, don't envy your neighbor's ox or ass. So it was taken for granted there had to be slavery. And it wasn't very nice, but you just accepted it and didn't think about it too much. And you try to treat your slaves quite nicely, but if you beat them and they died, well, that wasn't the end of the world. And that literally, well, almost literally is what a verse in the book of Leviticus says. Now, later on, people said, hang on, surely there's better ways of structuring society. Surely we don't need slaves. And people in the USA, people in the UK and elsewhere around the world spoke against their own economic interest, actually. They said, I know it's economically convenient for us to have slaves, but frankly, it's a bad way to structure society. So there was a huge movement. One of the best things about human history was this movement to abolish slavery, which united people from all walks of life. So in the same way, I foresee potentially an even bigger movement coming, which is the movement that's going to call not for the abolition of slavery anymore, although that still needs to be said in some parts of the world, but for the abolition of aging, for the death of death. It will happen if people demand it and people organize themselves wisely 
in roughly the same way that people demanded it and organized themselves wisely for the abolition of slavery. Ah, okay. Well, and again, that speaks so well to the moral imperatives involved with this, just as slavery was this tremendous moral imperative, you know, to liberate people and equalize the world. We can do the same thing in terms of health. So I want to get into a couple of examples here. In September of 2015, BioViva CEO Liz Parrish underwent experimental gene therapy that boosted her muscle density and lengthened her telomeres, reversing common markers of biological age. Uh, Dr. David Sinclair at Harvard Medical School has a team that claims to have reversed aging in the muscles and brains of mice. These are only two examples of many treatments that may have already reversed aging to a greater or lesser degree. And I think that we're not even entirely sure yet how much, but I'm wondering, is immortality already here, just not evenly distributed? That's a good way of putting it. It's not here yet for any humans. It's not here yet for many of the other animals, but it has been demonstrated to an extent that we can reverse some aspects of aging via the treatments, two of which you've just mentioned. And as you also said, there's many more than these two. Both of these are relatively new ideas. The idea of extending your telomeres is quite recent in, in terms of history. And people initially were skeptical. They said, well, if you extend the telomeres, you're fighting against the natural mechanism, which is that if cells keep on dividing indefinitely, you're going to get more cancer. Therefore, it was said the reason why most cells in the body stop dividing after a certain number of divisions, even though that has its own problems, we get weak when we get older, it was to stop cancer coming. So people predicted that if there were treatments that extended telomere length, people would get more cancer. Or in the first instance, it was that mice would get more cancer because this genetic intervention, it's injecting a natural enzyme called telomerase, which can extend the telomeres, which will allow the cells to keep on dividing. When this was applied in various mice in middle age, two things were noticed. First, the mice had a boost in their health span and lifespan. And secondly, they did not become more prone to having cancer. So it's more complicated what causes cancer. And it might even be that it's short telomeres that cause dysfunction and it triggers uh, cancer. So there's a whole new field of study there. I'm not saying we've got to the bottom of it yet, but the indications are that you can extend telomeres longer than happens in nature and you can get benefits from it. So after the lead of Liz Parrish, more and more people are experimenting with this in a variety of different model organisms and to some extent in humans as well. It's much the same with what David Sinclair is doing with his epigenetic reprogramming, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it involves resetting some of the aspects of the aging of cells. The aspect in particular is that the longer the cells continue in use, the DNA in them gets covered increasingly by so-called tags. They are methyl groups, the CH3 groups, that get involved in some of the skin layer, as it were, I'm speaking loosely, around the DNA, and therefore changes which genes in each cell are turned on or off. And there's a reasonably constant rate in many animals of the increase of this epigenetic aging. Now, it turns out there are treatments discovered by a Nobel Prize winner, Shinya Yamanaka, that if you put these proteins into cells, it will undo some of these uh, epigenetic markers. Now, if you put them too much, you'll put the cell right back to its original pluripotent state when it doesn't even know what kind of cell it's meant to be. It was a skin cell, but it's now gone back to being uh, able to do anything. And when you do that, you do get more cancers. But if you control it, and this is what the, what's so exciting about the experiments by David Sinclair of Harvard, if you turn it on and off selectively, you can get the benefits without the drawbacks. And he has, as you have mentioned, improved muscles and eyes in mice and also restored eyesight in some cases in primates in restoring the vitality of these cells. 
seems to restore not just that part of the vitality, it seems to waken up other youthful mechanisms. And so other parts of damage in the body involving these cells gets fixed too. So that's two interesting lines of research. And I'm here to say we should be going much faster with this. There isn't enough funding in all the different ideas that are on the table. We've mentioned two. There's at least 20 ideas on the table, 20 quite different ideas on the table for how we can learn from nature, learn from the animals I mentioned earlier, the ones with negligible senescence, learn from human super ages, who are the remarkable people who live well into their 90s without any of the usual diseases of aging, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, or dementia. We can learn from them, but we don't have enough funds available to actually accelerate that research. So we need to change how we are as a society allocating some of our discretionary cash. Well, and I want to remind the audience that you mentioned 20 different examples in nature that we can learn from. I want to remind the audience that the book is entitled The Death of Death. I'm going to put a link into the show notes for that. And so for them to learn more, I mean, you have you've done a ton of research and you have tremendous expertise in this. And so we are just skimming the surface, right? Like you mentioned, the Yamanaka factors. Um, that's something that I haven't touched on at all today, but there is so much there and it's moving so rapidly. So I wanted to ask about the aging boomer population and whether that is a driving factor for this research, because things are moving forward so fast right now. And I'm wondering if that is because I mean, the boomer population is getting older, they are starting to you know, deal with these aging related diseases. Um, they have right now the generational accumulation of wealth. They're able to put that into medicinal treatments. Is that what's pushing all of this forward, do you think? It is an important factor. And one thing we have to thank the boomers for is when they were younger, many of them were hippies. Many of them were not just going to accept whatever societal rules were laid down. They said, war? No, oh, peace and love, man. And they, obviously, they were different. They weren't all the same by any means. But there's enough of them who are willing to be contrary to general social expectations. And so some of them are saying now, let's have a little bit more good health. They're not necessarily saying they all want to live indefinitely because they're still psychologically oppressed from being able to give voice to that saying. But many of them are saying, you know, they'd like to have another 10 or 20 years of good quality life, even though they're in their 60s or 70s now. They would like to have that quality of life for another few decades far beyond what has historically been the norm for the majority of the population. So they are pressing for some treatments that they know about, like stem cell treatments, which have been discussed quite a lot there, pushing and campaigning for these to be more accessible more quickly without taking such a long time. So they are certainly helping change the social zeitgeist, making it acceptable to ask for at least another 10, 20 years. And here's the interesting thing that if you do extend your health span by 10 or 20 years, something that's going to happen in that period is that more treatments should be discovered and unveiled. So you might get some simple rejuvenation treatments in your 50s and 60s, but by the time you have reached your 70s, and by that stage, by the way, you are as healthy as you were in your 60s because of this partial rejuvenation, there will be another set of new treatments. It might not be Yamanaka factors anymore. It might be some incredible new combination of treatments. And that will give us another 10 years. And in that remaining 10 years, there'll be yet more treatments. This is sometimes called the concept of the longevity escape velocity, or LEV. Disclosure here, you mentioned I sit on the board of the LEV Foundation, and that is named after that concept, that what we want is to hurry up with at least partial success in some treatments, which will allow people who can live long enough to take advantage of the next round and the next round. And so we say, if you live long enough now, you will be able to live long enough to live forever or to live indefinitely. Well, another aspect of this uh, you know, on the other end of things, right? Because the boomers are on the upper end of the age scale. Another thing that we're seeing, and you touched on this earlier, is demographic transition, where uh, birth rates are actually expected. Uh, they're already starting to plateau in most of the in the most of the world, most Western nations, and 
they're expected to potentially drop, maybe even bottom out. I, I've read projections that show that there might be up to a tenfold decrease in population in the next 100 years. And in in many ways, that comes from greater education, a change in job roles, um, a change in societal expectations. There are a lot of things that aren't necessarily negative. It's just a change in human society that's leading to massively decreased birth rates. And again, we're seeing that in most Western nations right now. Uh, do you see that as a pressure on the other end of things to increase the lifespan and the health span of the population that we already have? And I, I view that as good. I mean, the argument, as you mentioned earlier, people say, well, what about overpopulation? Well, if not as many people are being born, then we I mean, we have so many pressures to keep people here. Do you see that as part of this? Absolutely. This is an incredibly important topic. This changes some of the discussion from just humanitarian concerns, which are incredibly important, but also to economic concerns, which will get the attention of politicians more rapidly. As you said, there's some concern about overpopulation, but that's an abstract future concern. What is already a pressing concern is the demographic transition. There are more and more countries in which there are fewer people under the age of 65 to take care of the people who are over 65. That ratio has changed a lot, and it is accelerating. It's not just in the Western world. China has had a decrease in population over the last few years. There are it's not just because of the single child policy that Mao put in place. Nowadays, many Chinese couples aren't at all interested in having large families. They might have one, but if families just have one child, then the population is going to go down and there's going to be more grandparents around who are dependent on a single grandchild. One single grandchild having to support four grandparents. That's a real struggle in society. I think the country in the world with the lowest birth rate per a woman is South Korea. It's less than one. And Japan is in a similar state. So many countries are facing a crisis. We can call it underpopulation, but the better description is this demographic transition in which the pyramid of ages, which used to be like this with most people on the bottom, is becoming inverted. I'm struggling to illustrate this. But there's more people at the top. And the issue is going to be, there's nothing wrong with having people at the top, provided they're fit and healthy. And if they want to, they can be still part of the economy. Some people prefer to stop working, but other people are quite happy. I mean, I'm well in my 60s now, and I'm not in the slightest interest in slowing down. I want to keep on keeping on involving in companies, involving in organizations, and many others, so long as we're fit and healthy, will be happy to be active members of the economy, consuming, but also producing. And that is what it will be enabled by wise early prevention techniques, rejuvenation techniques, as in the famous saying, a stitch in time saves nine. If we give people some rejuvenation therapies in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, that might be costly, but nothing like as costly as the amount of money that typically is spent due to chronic diseases of old age in the last few years of your life. When for most people, the largest healthcare costs in your entire life are in these last few years. So if we don't want to have to spend that amount of money in the last few years, let's keep people healthy earlier. And that's going to be a big boon, a big boom for everybody. It will allow also the limited health budgets of each country to go spread more widely, more evenly, and to help a wider part of the population. So all these economic arguments are summed up under the phrase, the longevity dividend. It's a bit similar to the old idea of the peace dividend. You know, if countries don't have to go to war, they can beat swords into plowshares. They don't need to spend so much money on defense. They can put more money into more uh, productive use. Well, in the same way, if we don't have to spend lots of money in the aging decline area of life, we can invest more early in life and we can have many other benefits too, the longevity dividend. And more politicians are waking up to this and they are no longer afraid of people living longer. They just want to ensure for the sake of their national economies, balancing the books, that people who live longer are, as I said, healthy in that older age too. 
Well, and that's an excellent point. And one of the things that I have been reading consistently because I have elderly parents and I keep encouraging them to stay active, right? Stay engaged and, you know, work in one form or another. I mean, my, my mother walks, she does gardening, you know, she's retired, but those are her activities. And, you know, the more that you keep moving, the healthier you remain. That's what I've been consistently reading. And so, you know, as you're saying, uh, people have the ability to remain in the workforce if they want if they don't, they should at least try and engage in other activities to get them out, keep them social, keep them active. You know, I realize I'm I'm preaching a little bit, but you know that's something that's been it's so an important, important message. We already know things that will help people extend their health span, not all the way to 120, but it can give them another three, four, five, maybe ten years of healthy life. Getting active is important. My mother, bless her, she'll be 88 next month. She plays golf twice a week not 18 holes, nine holes. They don't keep score and they just have a great time together. And the social camaraderie together with the exercise, I'm sure it's helping her keep herself as a healthy octogenarian rather than a decrepit, uh, unfortunate octogenarian. So the exercise, the social interactions, positive social interactions rather than doom and gloom social interactions. So pick your colleagues your companions well. Having a purpose in life helps. And there's a whole bunch of things about good sleep, about a uh, good food, not eating too much, and other kinds of exercise, stress training uh, as well. If you put all that together, along with some supplements, which are already available, some treatments which are widely possible, that's what people call bridge one. This is a term introduced by Ray Kurzweil and his medical colleague Terry Grossman in some of their writings. Bridge one allows you to live longer now. That will allow you to take advantage of bridge two treatments of the kind that we've been talking about earlier, the epigenetic reprogramming, the telomere extensions, and a whole bunch of other things. And that will allow us in due course to take advantage of what's called the bridge three treatments, which are nanotech reprogramming in which there are smaller little robots, we can call them that, or intelligent biological entities that are placed inside the body and will more comprehensively clean up the damage of aging that's accumulated. Ah, well, some of the other things that you explore, again, the title of the book is The Death of Death. I'm going to put links in the show notes so anyone watching this can go down there and, and find that on Amazon. You're talking about exponential advances in artificial intelligence, tissue regeneration, stem cell treatment, organ printing, cryopreservation, and genetic therapies. And there are varying levels of advances that are already here for these. For instance, cryopreservation has been quietly moving forward very rapidly. Uh, most people may be aware of the fact that cryopreservation is already used for tissue samples. Tissue samples are routinely frozen and then thawed back out and used for various activities. Um, whole body cryopreservation, once upon a time, it was thought that ice crystals would destroy cells irreparably. From what I understand, companies like Alcor have made tremendous progress in that area, and they believe that it may be possible to completely uh, thaw out a person without ice crystal damage just by preparing beforehand, I guess. So these are these are all moving forward and there's a convergence with them as well, right? Like artificial intelligence and computing are helping drive medical advances in these other areas. Is that right? Absolutely. Artificial intelligence is probably the single most transformative technology because how does technology progress? It progresses by the application of intelligence. And if we have artificial intelligence that can be combined with our human intelligence, and when that artificial intelligence becomes increasingly capable and increasingly creative, as has happened in the last few years, it's opening possibilities for much faster progress in a whole field. And now we could talk a long time about this. Maybe I'll just confine my remarks to the important subcategory of drug discovery and drug verification which has actually been a disappointing story in some sense from the 1950 onwards. Every eight years or so, the amount of new drugs that could be brought around 
from spending a billion dollars in fixed costs has halved. It hasn't doubled, it has halved. So it's gone exactly the opposite way from what we often call Moore's Law, which says that every 18 months in this case, the amount of computing power you could get for a fixed cost doubles. Well, in this case, it's become harder and harder to uh, discover new drugs. So people sometimes call this tendency not Moore's Law, but Irum's Law, where Irum is Moore spelt backwards. As I said, there's a different doubling period. It's eight years. I think it's eight years rather than 18 months. But it has had really challenging effects. And why has that happened? And there's a whole host of reasons why that's happened. Some of the easier treatments have already been found. We're also more aware these days of complications that often drugs have side effects. So there's more testing that's mandated. And during these extended tests, often there have been issues discovered. So how can drugs help with this? Well, they can help in a, ver sorry, how can AI help to improve that process? It can help in a number of ways. It can help to suggest new drugs that have never been considered before. It can help to suggest existing drugs that are known to be safe and used in some cases that might have other uses. And Controversially, but very interestingly, there is a suggestion that if you use deep learning to scan the results of phase one of medical trials, it's able to predict more accurately which of these drugs will pass successfully through phases two and three. And that's very important because most drugs fail somewhere in phases two or three. And if you can know in advance which ones are more likely to pass, that's great. So that's a very quick introduction to what's actually a very big subject, the use of AI to improve the drug discovery and testing phase. You can also look at another application of AI, which is AlphaFold. AlphaFold is developed by a team in Google DeepMind, which can predict from the description of a protein in terms of which amino acids it's composed of. A protein is a string of maybe thousands of amino acids, and its behavior in medical interactions, in disease, depends on its three-dimensional structure. And if you can know in advance reliably what structure it would have, it can help you to do what I was talking about earlier, namely the, the design drug interactions to stop diseases. And it's been a problem for 60 years to figure out the three-dimensional structure and therefore the typical chemical and biochemical interactions, and that has been comprehensively solved. Very quickly in the end, after a slow period in which nothing happened, very quickly in the end, Google's uh, team have solved this. And it's not long afterwards, we can imagine that there'll be even more complex models in which we can work out in advance what's going to happen if we combine molecules and treatments in new ways. So there's a lot to be done there. There's a lot that hasn't been happening yet, for some parts of the treatments, we're still in a relatively early phase of the exponential curve, and I have to put cryopreservation techniques in that category. Yes, there has been some progress, some impressive progress, which most people don't know about in terms of different antifreeze or different uh, compounds which can be put into the body to replace the water there so that when the body is cooled, there isn't damage put in place. So there has been some significant improvements there, but there's still a lot more that needs to be done. And that's a field where, frankly, the funding has not been anything like as much as it should be. So there's an argument for why this should be raised, not just it will help to cryopreserve whole bodies, it will help us to cryopreserve organs that are larger than those which can currently easily be cryopreserved. Currently, we can do things like cryopreserve uh, an, a fertilized a, cell. So, you know, you create uh, cells in so-called in vitro fertilization, and then you put them in deep freeze, sometimes for years, sometimes even for decades, and then bring them back to life. But when you get larger organs, that doesn't work so well, because as you pointed out, there is water and other things in there. Now, if we could find ways to more reliably keep hearts, or livers, or lungs, or other organs cryopreserved, after a terrible accident in which somebody has died, but their organs are in good state, if we could keep them until it's maybe a few days or a few weeks later, there is a good match for them for a, a trans, uh, transplant, then this will make a big difference to the number of people who get successful transplants. There are far too many people waiting for transplants who can't get them. 
because currently the amount of time an organ can be kept after that accident is far too short. On that note, David, let me thank you so much for your time today. Again, the book is The Death of Death. We have barely scratched the surface of all of the tremendous advances that are moving forward. And as you've said several times, there is so much more that needs to be done. But I would say overall, it, this is such a, an, an incredibly positive field. There is so much amazing work that is happening and it's moving so rapidly. It's just tremendously heartening. So let me thank you again for your time. I want to close by asking what comes next for you? Um, what are your current projects? What do you see in the headlines, I guess, for the next few months? And what will you be doing in the near future? Well, I'd like to draw our viewers and listeners' attention to a project called the Dublin Longevity Declaration. It can be found at DublinLongevityDeclaration.org. It is a petition, an open letter. It has been signed by over 100 of the world's leading longevity scientists, People who don't agree about everything, they've got different views about which treatments deserve the most attention. Uh, they have different views as to the timescales in which significant progress can be made. But they have agreed all to put their names to this letter that says, hey, people of the world, put more money into this. Put more focus onto this. This is a good and worthwhile thing. There is lots of possibilities. There are lots of possibilities that deserve attention. And it's not just the experts who have signed this. We have opened it up to members of the general public. And it is good if members of the general public sign it, read it carefully, figure out whether you agree with it or not. And if you agree with it, put your name there, describe who you are. If you're a mechanic or if you're a researcher, if you're a podcaster, whatever you are, just say, say that in the signature list. Because the more people who put their name to it, politicians will start paying attention. And other people will start saying, you know what? This is a growing movement. So we want to build this movement. So it won't just be that the longevity industry becomes the world's largest industry, something I think will indeed happen over the next decade. The longevity activist community will be the world's largest activist community, because after all, if we are successful, it will have the largest positive impact on quality life. So people should look at that the Dublin Longevity Declaration. It's called Dublin because it was announced at a longevity conference in Dublin, the Dublin, the, the Longevity Summit Dublin earlier this year. And there's a number of people behind it, including the organization where I spend maybe two days a week of my time. I mentioned it already, LED Foundation. And I'm putting more of my time into that because I think that's where I can make a big difference. It's accelerating the useful and practical coordination of resources and ideas. The rest of my time, I'm talking a lot about AI because as I, as I mentioned, AI has the biggest potential to accelerate many of these treatments. But at the same time, if AI is used carelessly, it can cause lots of grief. And if I look ahead at what might kill me in my own life, it might be diseases of aging or it might be a disaster caused by carelessly created AI. So what I do in maybe three days a week of my time is I'm involved in activities to try and help people change their minds about AI. We shouldn't be rushing just to create the first AI that we can. We should instead be rushing to create safe artificial general intelligence so that we'll have great benefits from that. So these are my two big projects. They both fit together. They've almost got the same name, Safe Aging and Safe AGI. Uh, but they're both involved with things that could truly impact, either for good or for bad, the lives of billions of people. And that's something well worth putting my time into. David, thank you again so much for your time today, sir. It's a pleasure. Thank you.